Welcome to the She's Bold Podcast. I'm Beth Whitman. Hello from Seattle. I am recording this introduction and then I am literally (laughs) getting ready to walk out the door to the airport to head to Denver. I'm going to be at the Outdoor Retailer Show and it's where, I don't know, a thousand or thousands, maybe thousands of manufacturers gather to exhibit their new products that are coming out. And uh, as you might imagine, it's outdoor, outdoor retailer. Oh gosh, it's everything from outdoor and travel clothes, gear, shoes, kayaks, backpacks, headlamps, food, lotions and potions and travel bags and just everything, anything that you would need and a lot of things that you don't need (laughs) for the outdoor world and adventure world and running world too. There's some running uh, running companies there as well. So what I do is I spend this week meeting with companies and I find out all about these new products. And the really cool thing is, I, and I always try to do this, my, my days are pretty filled, like back-to-back meetings, but I always try to schedule in time when I can just walk the floor and find out about new companies that are out, new products that are coming out to market soon or are on the market, but not a lot of people know about them. And so I check out what's new. These companies give me or send me products. And then I give them, I test them out and I give them a shout out in my newsletters. And that's fun for me. I get to see kind of what's coming out that's new, what the trends are. And then I get to share that information with you and with my newsletter (laughs) subscribers. So if you're not already a subscriber, what you can do is you can go to wanderlustandlipstick.com. It's W-A-N-D-E-R, wanderlustandlipstick.com. Just sign up for the newsletter there. It comes out usually once or twice a month. And there in the newsletter, I include information about tours that I lead through Wander Tours. And uh, there's often links to travel tips. And also, that's where you're going to find out about new products. And sometimes I do music or movies and all sorts of fun stuff. A lot of it's adventure related, travel related, that sort of thing. So, and I also I have contests with giveaways for products. Um, so you'd have a chance to win, gosh, we just gave away uh, Swank sunglasses from the company Tafosi, and I've given away Eagle Creek luggage, hiking boots from Loa. Um, so really, it's a wide range of stuff, and I think you'd like it if you're not already part of that community. Now, this trip to Denver is a bit unusual <laughs> because instead of bringing all the things that I might use, like usually I'll just bring everything and uh, just a lot of stuff maybe doesn't get used. And what I've done on this trip, I'm gone for three nights, I've pared down and I am bringing one pair of shoes and I'm bringing one change of clothes and I'm bringing my laptop. I'm not bringing any running shoes or gear, clothes for running. I'm not bringing my podcast equipment. What I am doing is I'm bringing a half-filled carry-on bag. It's an Eagle Creek bag, and it, that is actually going to be coming out in an upcoming newsletter, uh, so you'll see a little review of that. And then what happens, I get a bunch of swag when I'm there, and I always forget that part, so I usually stuff my carry-on bag to the brim when I go to one of these shows, and then I've got nothing to carry stuff back in, but this time it's going to be kind of half-filled, and then I'll pick up all this stuff and be able to bring it back uh, with me. So, And it actually feels great to be traveling so light, and honestly, I'm not even packed yet. I've got a couple of clothes that are laying out. I've got an explosion of things around and I've just got to toss it all in this bag and literally, like I said, walk out the door. So, hey, you know what? Speaking of traveling light, this is actually a great segue because today's guest traveled light across Europe on the Camino de Santiago. And it was a way to unplug from what she calls 24-7 screen time. Now, this is Beth Giacino and her husband, Eric. They walked a thousand miles of the Camino over 79 days. That actually sounds really glorious to me. I think it would be great. Now, Beth was not an athlete. She wasn't super fit. She wasn't even a traveler. She just knew that she had to find a way to unplug and get away from her devices. And what she found in doing this trip was a world where people actually look at each other in the eye when they talk and they connect and they share stories. And she's got some great stories to, to talk about and share uh, with folks. She has a book out and she'll talk about that, that book. Now, what she basically did was a couch to a thousand miles. 
And although she did a lot of research, she didn't train at all. And she packed her backpack the night before she left. (laughs) Now, that's not to say that that's an ideal way to take on an adventure, but it certainly goes to show you that pretty much anything is possible. There's a lot of inspiration in her story and the fact that she is an average person, more like women that we all know. You know, she's very much like that. Yet something clicked for her. She changed her mindset and she took on something that she hadn't previously even considered possible. And she writes about that in her book, Walking to the End of the World. Before I get to that conversation, this episode is number 95. (laughs) So I'm inching up to 100 episodes. And I've got something special planned for the 100th episode. But I am also working on another Ask Me Anything episode where I answer your questions. So hit me up on social, send me an email at beth at she's bold podcast.com or call 877-280-5170 and leave a message with your question or comment or feedback or whatever you'd like to do. Okay, thanks so much for that. Thanks for being here today. As always, I really, really appreciate my fabulous, dedicated listeners. And with that, please enjoy this conversation with Beth Jacino. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to throw myself under the bus and maybe just admit something right out front. I have your book, Walking to the End of the World, A Thousand Miles on the Camino de Santiago, but I haven't read it yet. Ooh. I know. Now, so that's one thing. But the bigger picture here and the reason why I bring it up, because I think it's kind of an important topic because you work in the book industry. I do. And you... You probably, I want to hear exactly what you do for one thing, but you probably have your finger kind of on the pulse of the book world and how it's changed Mm -hmm. in the last 10, 15 years Mm -hmm. or so dramatically. And then I'll tell you that you're in good company because I've got about 15 books on my bedside table (laughs) that have that are also waiting to be read. (laughs) They are. (laughs) And that's the problem. But, you know, it's, um, I've been really good lately in terms of, not getting sucked into my phone and Mm -hmm. social media, Mm -hmm. because I think that is a big problem for myself, because it's, you know, the explosion of information about Facebook and just kind of we were realizing that we have been manipulated into these things being addictive, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm not I'm in good company in terms of that. uh, But so I've, I've kind of weaned myself off of that. Yet, you know, I run my own business as you do. Right. And there's you just can't turn it off. no, you can't turn it off. And there's just, there's not enough time to read all the books right. that I want to read. Right. So with that admission by myself, um, <laughs> and just it's kind of with that as a starting point, tell me what exactly you do in the book industry and kind of sure. the changes that you've seen over the past and how you manage it. And do you read and what are you reading? <laughs> oh my goodness, all of the above. Um, <laughs> So I've been working in the business side of book publishing for almost 20 years. I have been an editor. I have been a literary agent. I have worked in marketing. 10 years ago, I left traditional publishing and I took a year off. I was volunteering for the American Red Cross for a year. And I came back and realized that the entire industry had kind of changed because that was about the time that the Kindle exploded and Amazon kind of took over the self-publishing idea. And suddenly authors had all of these opportunities and ways to get their work in front of people that they had didn't have before. And we went from, in the United States, publishing about 200,000 books a year, which sounds like an amazingly large number, to over a million. So there's last year alone, there were more than 1 million new books published. So those stacks of books on your bedside table and the stacks of books sitting on my bookshelf at home Many of us have that. We have more things to read. We have more opportunities. We have more interesting words and interesting stories from all different people. What I am doing and what I've been doing for the last nine years or so is I'm a publishing consultant. I am primarily an editor. I work with people who have written books and I help them get their big ideas out there and look at the big picture and and structure both fiction and nonfiction to, to communicate well. I'm also a ghostwriter um, and collaborator. So I work with other people who have stories to tell and maybe don't have the the writing skills or the time, honestly. To, Would you write to my do book it. for me? Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a pen for hire. 
But I've always been working with, up until the point at which walking to the end of the world happened, I've always been working with other people's words. I love books. I love words. I do read voraciously. It's I consider it part of my professional training, but also it's just the way that I can let my brain settle at the end of the day. And equal parts fiction and nonfiction. If I'm working on a novel, I need to be reading nonfiction for fun. Mm-hmm. And if I'm working on nonfiction, I need to be reading a novel just so that my brain doesn't get confused. But there's this concept of shaping other people's stories, shaping other people's words, and getting that bigger sense of the world while still sitting on my couch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the the challenge of working in publishing is that it is by definition a rather sedentary job. You're sitting, you're, you're, yeah. you're at a laptop. Like my job is to be on a laptop computer. There's no way around that. I could treadmill desk it. I could, you know, do things during the day, mm-hmm. but my eyes are on a screen and my mm-hmm. fingers are on a keyboard and there's only so much activity you can do in that. What were you doing before book publishing and that kind of work? I have been in book publishing, I'm magazine publishing okay. and nonprofit communications. You know, I've been in communications pretty much since I got out of school. Well, you actually bring up a really good point that I had never thought of before. And maybe that's my problem with not reading as much because my days are very active. Mm-hmm. And it's everything from exercise to running Mm -hmm. to when I do sit down in front of the laptop, I'm working on tours and answering emails and Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Or I'm outside working in the garden or, Mm -hmm. you know, walking to the grocery store trying to be active. And then there's not a lot of time by the end of the day that I want to sit down and read. I usually fall asleep. I mean, that's the I was going to say, there's not a lot of energy by the time the sun goes down, it sounds like. Yes. Yeah. So you, because you love it, it's Mm -hmm. not like it's just because it's part of your job, but you are spending your days reading. I am spending a large portion of my days and my work days, especially reading. Yes. Mm -hmm. Working with people's words. Mm Mm-hmm. And one of the things I would say, though, is this is, I think, part of the reason we're seeing an explosion in audiobooks is because of that active lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Because it, And same with podcasts, mm-hmm. too, yes, right? Because exactly. you, you can listen to things while you walk. You can listen to things on your hikes. You know, I listen to podcasts while I'm, on, while I'm walking to the grocery store or to my office or through the park by my house. Mm. I can't just sit at home right. and listen of course. to a thing. I need to be doing something. And, so, and I have a friend who her day job is as a professional artist. She's a sculptor. And she gets through more books than I could ever dream of because she spends long hours polishing and shaping and things. Mm-hmm. And she's, she's hearing it. things the whole time. Mm-hmm. And I wish I had that ability. I wish I could listen to things and work at the same time. Do you listen to audiobooks? Like when you are out on your walks? Um, I listen mostly to podcasts while I'm out on my walks. Mm -hmm. I listen to audiobooks, especially on long drives. Mm -hmm. So last fall when I was on a much more intensive book tour and going from bookstore to bookstore and going all up and down the West Coast, I had a list of, of audiobooks that I had downloaded and And it just makes it so much easier. You know, I remember I used to have an hour commute each way every day. And I listened to a ton of audiobooks during those years. But it was back in the days when you had the CDs that you had to check out of the library. (laughs) And, you know, you have to shuffle everything. And now that you can just put everything on one device and plug it in wherever you are, it's so much easier. But it's also, to me, that's even more overwhelming. Like my days, I'm a big big music person. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that it was so much easier easier to find artists i mean like to your point earlier that there was there was an explosion in the book industry yeah. because people could get their stuff out yes. there it's the same with artists mm-hmm. but it just seemed to me that with music i could hone in on an artist or a genre and have my cd or my mixtape mm-hmm. and <laughs> and be able to listen and now it's almost so overwhelming that if i go to itunes or if i go to like we've got Easy Street Records up mm-hmm. on California um, here in West Seattle, which is awesome. It's like so overwhelming. I, it's like I almost don't even know where to start. Right. You know, that's the, right. that's the thing. So when you talk about being able to take things out of the library and mm-hmm. having kind of that access, it seemed it seemed easier mm-hmm. because it seemed a little bit more limiting. This is why independent bookstores are thriving. You know, we talked when Amazon started, it was going to be the death of the bookstore and it was going to take over everything. And in the last few years, the number of independent small bookstores across the country 
is increasing. Really? And the number of people who are shopping at them is increasing because of exactly what you just said. People want that curated feel. You go to Amazon and there are 6 million books. How do you even start Mm -hmm. if you don't know what you're looking for? You go into, I live up in Finney Ridge in in North Seattle. You go into Finney Books and it is run by people who love books and who have personal recommendations and who can tell you this. Oh, you're, I know you, you live in the neighborhood. Oh, you're interested in this. Here's this thing I think you might like. And they have events and they have places where you can kind of filter through all of the noise. Mm -hmm. Social media and the internet has just become so much noise. You need that thing to help you. You need the person that you trust. You need the guy that you trust. Well, I'm encouraged that you say that because our local independent bookstore closed a number of years ago. You're about to get another one. Where? Um... I don't know, but I've been following them on social media yeah. because I don't know West Seattle very well. Ah, but you okay. are, yeah, there's, there's, they've leased the space. They have pictures of them. Oh, it's good. in West okay. Seattle somewhere. Yeah, good, good. I'll check it out. Our West Seattle blog, I'm sure we'll have uh, yeah. information have about it. I'll send you the name of it. When yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the so we lost Barnes & Noble, mm-hmm. which is not an independent bookstore, you know, to your point there. But, but just having lost that, like to me... It was a lot of fun to go into Barnes and yeah. Noble even yeah. and just walk around and kind of get ideas and, and buy gifts mm-hmm. too, you know, just to have that tactile mm-hmm. feeling of it. But good to know about the about that bookstore coming here and and I'm encouraged by the, the growth factor. Yeah. And you have your finger on the pulse of that, so you would know that. So it's nice to hear it. And I think there's also I think there's a little bit of backlash against online purchases. Mm-hmm. And I think people are are like there's that whole buy in, in independent or buy local mm-hmm. day. Shop I lo- think yeah. yeah, shop local, shop local. Yeah, so I think independent people, bookstore day. Yeah, so I think people are um, are are more tuned into that. I heard about independent bookstore day in the Pacific Northwest, like in the Seattle area. Mm-hmm. Do you partake in that? Like, there's this passport. There's thing? a passport. There's so <laughs> I actually was part of it this past year. There's 21 bookstores that participate in the Puget Sound area. So on the peninsula and in the city and people get a little booklet and they plan their day. It's about seven and a half hours of driving, but they plan their day and they go from bookstore to bookstore and they get a stamp in each one. And if you visit all 21 bookstores in one day, you'll get, I think it's like 20% off all of the bookstores for a full year. Yeah. Yeah. If you visit just like three or four, you get a certain, you know, a certain kind of gift or prize. And, but they have, Snacks and they have things. This past year, uh, because I had had a book come out, I was part of third place books in Ravenna. I did. I was there for an hour and a half and did a signing. And I was just. I had a table with snacks and the books, and I talked to people about the Camino as they came through, and it was so much fun. Oh, that's great. My friends uh, Susan and Barbara own the Traveler Bookstore or the Traveler. I don't, don't want to say bookstore, but no, the, the Traveler, Traveler Store, store in, with books in Bainbridge. That yeah. was my. I did an event there. That was, I think, my second <sighs> event. After the release, I did an event a week or so after the They're release. They're sweethearts. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. They've been on three trips with me. Oh, cool. <laughs> They're awesome. Yeah. So good. Well, thanks for the, the update on the book industry. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. It, knowing it's that. It's definitely not, you know, the, what's the Mark Twain quote? Report, rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Mm-hmm. People always talk about how the book industry is dying, but more people are publishing and more people are reading, mm-hmm. you know, as much as, as much as the internet does take some of the attention away. Mm-hmm. We have not actually seen a drop in statistics of number of people who are reading a book in the last year. Hmm. And I love the fact that Amazon has a bookstore. <laughs> too, which they're testing really, out. They're they're testing out the physical bookstore because people is, want that experience. People really, want that. They want to go in and they want to walk around and they want to to see things. They want to let those covers speak to them. They mm-hmm. want somebody to. Amazon doesn't have booksellers who are making personal recommendations their their physical bookstores are still based on the algorithms of mm-hmm. what sells online yeah it's still kind of cool to yeah. go in there because oh, it's, yeah. i i went in fully expecting not to like it but it's, it's so it but it's also curated mm-hmm. too and it's really neat to see all this stuff in a niche topic all mm-hmm. on one bookshelf mm-hmm. so it's kind of cool but okay moving on yeah so you've got this great book out and it's based on pretty cool thing that you did in 2015, 2015. right? Was the, was the year that mm-hmm. you did it. So can you talk about the walk and kind of explain it? Because I know myself, I'm a bit 
ignorant on the Camino. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure not all listeners know exactly what the Camino is all about. So can you explain that? Sure. The Camino de Santiago is, in Spanish, it's the way of St. James. It is the thousand-year-old pilgrimage route that crosses Europe from all different directions, leading to a somewhat obscure city in northwest Spain called Santiago de Compostela, where in the 900s, a shepherd found what is reported to be the remains of St. James, one of the apostles of Jesus. And there are, I, I could spend an hour on just the stories behind that piece of history, But what came out of it was that as Christianity and the Roman Empire were spreading across Europe, people were traveling great distances to in this now kind of unified world. And they ended up millions of people in the 900s, thousands, 1100s, ended up crossing mountain ranges and countries to go to the city. And they established these routes that are still used today. A thousand years later, people from all over the world, uh, 300,000 people last year were coming from all over the world to walk these same paths that people have been walking. And they're leading, they start all across Europe. They start in different places in France. They start back in to Geneva. They start back into Switzerland and Germany. They start in Portugal. They cross Spain and they all lead to the city of Santiago. And in, I probably found out about this in about 20. 12, 2013, a friend that I was working with, a writer, fellow writer, had written a blog about how she had walked just the last hundred kilometers to Santiago with her daughter, but her daughter had started the trail much farther back. And she described mud and she described rain and she described blisters and she described (laughs) hills. And And you said, I want to go do that. (laughs) And at the same time, she also described, you know, fires at night and wine and meeting people from around the world and this incredible sense of satisfaction of, you know, much like me being a a writer who spends most of their time at a computer getting out and doing this thing. And I looked at it and I thought, that might be it. That might be the thing that I'm looking for. Because I was in a place where I was, I was just burned out. I was working 12 hours a day trying to start my own business, trying to run my own business. I had four different email accounts. I had this color-coded calendar that just never stopped blinking and beeping at me. And I'd been doing this for 20 years, and I had 20 to 40 years ahead of me, and I just needed something to stop and help me focus. I needed to be part of something that was real and something that was bigger than deletable email. And so I started looking into this this walk and and I I was very careful I always called it a walk because I was not a athlete I was not sporty I did not hike but I did walk a lot and I did not backpack but this idea of walking in Europe seemed to come with beds and bathrooms and that was really <laughs> important to me and so I started doing what a good bookworm like myself does. I went to the library and I checked out everything that, with the names Camino de Santiago on it. And that set up, you know, about two years of reading and research and thinking. And I went to my husband and said, I think this is a thing we need to do. And he was immediately on board because he is the opposite of me. He is very athletic. He was teaching parkour at the time here in Seattle and has always dreamed of walking the Appalachian Trail. And I always told him to have a nice time because that was not my thing. But this seemed like this had that long, epic walk. You know, I could look at a globe and see where we would start and finish. And at the same time, had enough of the creature comforts that it felt comfortable to me. And so it took us two years to plan it. It took us two years to find the time to take a long sabbatical in the midstream of careers. But that was a lot of answers to several of your questions. <laughs> well, my most immediate question is why did it take two years to come up with a time frame to, to take three months off? Because we were working and because we have family responsibilities and we have different pieces. We knew, you know, there's We didn't want to walk in the middle of winter. We wanted to walk and we didn't want to walk in the heat of summer because we're Northwesterners and we don't do heat. 
And so it was spring or fall. And then you have to look at a calendar and say, well, my sister's graduating from college and your parents are doing this. And we have pieces like that. But also Eric went to the place where he was working a year in advance and said, I want to take a sabbatical. I want to take a three month sabbatical. And not, not I want to, I'm going to. I'm going to do this trip. I'm going to be gone for three months. I want to come back here. I want to keep working for you. How can we make this work? And they were incredibly open to it. They were fantastic. They absolutely brainstormed and, and brought people in and arranged for a schedule. But in an organization with, I think at that point, you know, three full-time employees, taking three months off takes a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. And as in a publishing person, we tend to work with long lead calendars. I book six months in advance. Mm -hmm. And so I needed enough time to clear three months out of my schedule. It's, you know, I didn't have to ask permission, but you still have to figure out the details. Right. During those two years, uh, was it all about the planning or was it fits and starts? And was it, what the heck are we doing? Let's not do this. No, 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 no. The next morning you know, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, we are going to do this. What, what uh, it was, was definitely fits and starts. I don't think there was ever a, oh, maybe this isn't a good idea, but it's easy to get distracted. You know, having these big, I tend to be somebody who either makes a decision and dives in and starts it tomorrow and it's just done in a week. <laughs> I have moved across the country <laughs> twice with no idea a week before I left what was going to happen. But once you have so much time to think about it, it's easy to to let it slide onto the back burner. You know, you get caught up in, oh, well, we have this. This was what needs attention right now. And I think this was a lot of what I was trying to step away from is this this urgency rather than what's important. You know, you can your conversations around the dinner table can so easily turn into, well, what's your schedule tomorrow? And how do you, do you need the car? And when do you need the car? And who's going to be home? And who's going to stop and pick up this thing at the grocery store? And do you have our place bugged? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Because we share a car and that's yeah, exactly so do we. the, so do the we. conversations. We have every single day. And I tell him, I'm like, we need to have, so we need to talk about something other than the car. <laughs> but it's, you know, who's going where and how. And so, and you lose weeks like that. You lose months like that. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was why I started feeling the need for this in the first place mm -hmm. is because whole years were passing and I would look at the end of it and I would go, I don't know what happened that mattered. I was really busy all year. I did a lot of work. I have a lot of friends. I did some interesting, but there's nothing I'm going to look back on this year and say, this is what I remember. This is what I did. This is what I accomplished. And that was important to you when you realized. And it was important to me. Yeah. I, think, I think it was important to me to have, to have some kind, something that I could plant in the ground and say, this is real and I did this and I will always remember it and it will, it will affect me. Do you think that that's an important thing for everybody like I'm, I'm asking you to make a judgment call mm -hmm. but I'm I'm just wondering should everybody have that should everybody on December 31st or whatever designated mm -hmm. day it is be able to look back and go yep this year I bought a house or I got a new job or I went on this trip I think it's important to have a a marker point, whether I know a lot of people who it's their birthdays or it's the end of the year or it's whatever they do, to look back and say, this is what I did that matters. And I think what matters is going to be different to each person. What I did that matters is my kid got through third grade. Counts. Mm -hmm. What matters is, you know, we, we got ourselves out of debt. What matters, it doesn't have to be a grand adventure. It doesn't have to be, it definitely doesn't have to be a trip. But I think that what we've come from is we get so lost. And, you know, I'm in my 40s now and this season of life, it's so easy to get lost in the franticness of the day to day and say, I'm just checking things off the box. I'm just checking things off the list and I'm, I'm busy all the time and I'm doing these things all the time. But they just come back. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh my goodness, you do laundry. You have to do it again in a week. <laughs> <laughs> or you see these people, you do, whatever it's going to be, it, it's having those grounding points and giving yourself the time to identify what it is that is going to be important to you in those moments. It seems like living with intention mm -hmm. is, a, is a real key to mm -hmm. that, that. That, like you said, it doesn't have to be something grand, but at least being 
aware and alert Mm -hmm. and and doing things with intention Mm -hmm. is important. Mm -hmm. And there are seasons where you're never going to get out of your house, you know, when between childcare and elder care, there's, there's always going to be times when you feel like I'm never, I'm not, I'm just going through the motions. And so what are the things that can still give you that sense of, of this is what matters. This is what I will remember. Do you journal? Not regularly. I see you have a notebook. I have a notebook that is, I take notes usually more on the professional side or the work side than the personal side. Mm. I definitely journal. But when I am out during my daily routine, when I am doing something unusual, then yeah, I I journaled every day for the walk that we took, the 79 day walk that we took. And without the intention of writing a book, without the intention of it, at the end of the first day, 17 interesting things had happened and we'd (laughs) met five people and I had like seven anecdotes that were in my brain and I thought if every day is going to be like this I'm never going to hold on to it all I'm going to forget I don't know the name of the town I'm in right now I don't I don't know what will happen next I took very frantic notes at the end of every day to remind myself because I knew that these were going to be the stories I told at the time, I thought those were going to be the stories I told over margaritas at taco night with my friends mm-hmm. forever, because these are places I was only going to see once mm-hmm. and people I was only going to meet. And there was no way I was going to meet them in any other type of experience. Do you think it's possible to bring that same amount of awe and interest to your everyday life? Or do you think by the very nature of living Mm -hmm. and waking up in the morning and rolling out of bed and making your coffee and brushing your teeth, that it's just not possible. I think that there is a sense of intention. I think that what the Camino gave me, walking the Camino becomes this very almost meditative process because it breaks it down to the simplest structure of your day. You walk, you eat, you sleep, you repeat, and you wake up the next morning and you do it again. You have Two sets of clothes. And so there's never a question of what you're going to (laughs) wear. You have every town that you're in is different, but the pattern of the day is very similar. And you're spending hours a day putting one foot in front of the other. And it gives you a lot of time to discover that, that intention. I think that in daily life, you so easily lose track of that because there's so much other input. I don't have one task today. Today is not just about drive to West Seattle, put on some headphones and talk to you. There's 14 things happening on my cell phone right now while we're talking. I know I have to be seven other places with three other conversations about entirely different things. And so my mind is so fragment, like I'm so fractured in modern life that it's, you have to clear some space. Was it like that 10 years ago, 15 years ago for you? It was not to this. I I kind of look back and say, oh, sweetie, you thought you were burned out then. (laughs) (laughs) Look at me now. (laughs) You know, I don't want to go down this road too far, but we left in 2015. We came back in July at the beginning of the 2016 presidential election. Like we came back to a very different world than we had left three months before. And that chaos and and just the amount of information that comes in that way and the the tones of the dialogues and the intensity of communication changed. And I decided to write a book, which meant I had to have a website, which meant I had all of these things going on on top of my normal day job. And we have family who live in Seattle now. And it seems like everything just continues to ramp up. And I am so incredibly grateful that I took a sabbatical at the time that I did, because I think it gave me, it gave me a base point. It gave me a place of saying, this is what it can be. You can break it down. You, you developed these mantras walking. You developed this idea of, you know, you practice acceptance and you look for surprises and you, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose was Eric's favorite phrase. And those, those ideas have carried me through into that. Did I bring home all of my Camino Zen and calm? No, of course not. I'm running around. One of the reasons why you did take that sabbatical was to unplug from technology. Yes. And can you talk about that sure. a little bit more specifically? We, like I said, one of the things that was really pushing my buttons was 
just this constant sense of needing to be on, this thing that was beeping at me, this thing that was demanding my attention. And I wanted to know what happened if I was not responding to every little last thing all the time. And so we made a really intentional decision to turn off our phones completely for the length of the walk. Wow. So for three months. So for three months, we had warned everyone in advance that we were unaccessible. And that turned, you know, everybody goes, well, I could never, I couldn't, I, my kids might need me or my dog might need me or my job. What if something happens at work? And it turns out that all of those things happen. But if you are not available, people figure out how to do it themselves. Every situation that arose while we were gone, someone else solved it. When did you have access? Like, did you check email at the end of the day or once a week? We had created a secret email, we called it. We had created a Gmail account that no one knew about because both Eric and I had our work email and our personal was, was all intertwined. So we couldn't, we knew if we opened our email boxes, we would just go down the rabbit hole and it was better just not to. And so we had, we had created this one secret email account and only our house sitter, who was also my sister, and I think he told his parents, um, but there were maybe two people who had, and the people we were going to meet along the way. We had friends who we, who actually came from Seattle and walked with us for a week mm -hmm. in a couple of different places. So people we needed to meet up with, and they were the only people who had that email. So if there was a family emergency, if someone... Something, right. Mm -hmm. And what we had said is if, if something dramatic, ha like if there is a crisis crisis, this is who you go through to get to us. Mm -hmm. They know how to get in touch with us. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we, we definitely didn't check every day. Maybe every three or four days we would log in and to this one email account. And as long as there was nothing there, mm -hmm. it was fine. Did you have a camera or did you use your phone camera. as a camera? I had a camera. I had a little pocket Canon that fit in the pants, in my pants pocket and took great photos and did nothing else. Mm -hmm. And so I took a bunch of photos all the way through, again, as this way of, of connecting myself back to it, of remembering these things that I had seen. I've been offline for, for the most part offline for close to a month. Um, I did a, the snowman trek in Bhutan, mm -hmm. which is a mm -hmm. 25 day trek across the Himalayas. And that trip itself is a total of 32 days because there's, there's pre trek and post trek with a little bit of Wi-Fi mm -hmm. access. So I know that feeling. And I know for me, it's kind of that same thing. It's like, you know what your day looks like. The mm -hmm. scenery is going to change, but you're going to get up at 6.30. You're going to have bed tea. Would they bring you tea in your, you know, to your tent? You get up, you pack your things, you have breakfast, you put on your backpack, and you start walking. And mm -hmm. then you do the same thing the next, the next day. day. But along the way, you don't have cell service. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, uh, I think we had some kind of a device for an emergency, like help us, you know, send a helicopter kind of thing. But during that time, this like first you're like, eh, what am I going to do being totally offline? And then you're like, eh, you know, by by the middle of it, like, I can't believe I've I ever get sucked into that mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of thing. I'll never go back to it. And then, yeah, well, I mean, and then it do. makes you so the people we met were the people we were interacting with. Every person we met, you could give them your full attention. One of the fantastic things about the Camino compared to a lot of the trails that I know of is that it does draw people from so many places. You know, our 14th wedding anniversary, we were in a little town in the middle of the Spanish Meseta, the Spanish Plains, where the buildings were still made out of straw and mud. And we shared dinner with a Swiss salesman, a Mexican mother and daughter, and a Korean exchange student. Nobody was looking at a phone. Everybody, and I should say, there is cell phone service all across. This is Europe. Mm -hmm. This is a first world country. You can have your Wi-Fi. You can have your cell phone service. Most of the people who walk the Camino have their phones out. So if it is, you know, if it's a consideration to say, no, I need to be connected, you're absolutely, it's easy to be connected. It's a choice not to be. But for me, giving your attention to people and not being distracted and not trying to do the grabby thing and... Sorry, you can't see me. I'm like reaching you are my grabbing. I'm reaching my hand out to the table as if I'm going to grab the phone even while I'm sitting here making eye contact with you. And to give that opportunity to be fully present, to see every field that you walk past, to make eye contact with cows, I like to joke about. I feel like I experienced every day so deeply because I was not distracted by anything else. There was not a person on the other side of the world trying to grab a piece of my my attention. And so I could I could be fully present. Isn't that interesting that even when nothing is going on 
and the phone isn't blowing up and the mm-hmm. texts aren't there, the idea that, with it turned on, the idea that it might, something might happen mm-hmm. takes up a little brain space. Yeah. Isn't that sad? You're just kind of, a, it's just an awareness piece. I know. Um, it's kind of, I don't, there are people who always have a TV on in the background and that for me, because I'm not used to it, it's that constant distraction for me it's a constant Mm -hmm. distraction for them it's a background noise but the phone i feel like is kind of the same thing it's like i know it's always on it may go i could push a button at any point and Mm -hmm. see if somebody liked my last instagram Mm -hmm. post Mm -hmm. i could see if what somebody is doing somewhere in the world and stepping away from that and i've done it in smaller pieces since then we we still try when we travel to go cell phone free we have we're trying to implement one day a week of screenless we're trying screenless Sundays. Mm. Have been all year. Hasn't always been very successful. Mm-hmm. That's a good but, goal, though. Yeah, it is a good goal. It's, mm. it's a good goal to just say there needs to be one day where you're not, where mm. everything is off. And no one, no one needs you. Were I you, don't have a job where lives are at stake. There are no crises in publishing. Were you ever itchy to be online or to know what was going on? Or were you just so consumed by what was happening? And like you said, that, that mm-hmm. eye contact interaction that it didn't it wasn't even a blip for you you know sometimes travel is hard travel can be overwhelming I it's I don't want to make it sound like this was all this magical thing there were days when I was sick of walking my feet hurt my you know my underwear was getting dried on the line over some cow pies and just I, I just want a moment of what my old life was. And so, yeah, there's definitely that temptation. There's definitely that. I could just check in and see what's going on. Was there anything that happened that somebody told you along the trail? Like, uh, you know, the only thing that really comes to mind that could have potentially happened was like a shooting, like at a school, because I don't think we've had any other bigger events Mm -hmm. than that. But was there anything like that where people said, oh, did you hear about the tsunami or did you hear about the shooting or did you hear about this? And you just thought, I didn't really need to know that. I didn't. Yeah. There were pieces and you would be in, you know, you would be in a Spanish bar or you would be in a restaurant or something and they would have a TV on in the background. And I remember, I think it was Baltimore was having riots. There had been a police incident and Baltimore was having riots and you were kind of vaguely aware that there was something up there and it didn't really affect me. But I knew that if I was in my normal life with the car radio on when I'm driving and this and that and the other thing, it would be all I knew Mm -hmm. about. And I, it was just this background. People on the trail largely talk about what's happening on the trail. Mm -hmm. Um, We call it, we know we call it radio Camino. Mm -hmm. Everybody runs into everybody and wants to talk about uh, while we walked, we spent 35 days walking across France and the French portions of the Camino trails are actually pretty, are not very well known, especially to Americans. You know, we always say we started in France. And go, oh, there's, there's ways to do that. And so for 35 days, we were the only Americans we met. And we were kind of a novelty to all of the other people on the trail. It is largely a French trail, but you have people from all different European countries and you have people coming in from Asia. And, you know, we we would walk into a place and they would say, oh, you're the Americans. I heard you were coming. <laughs> or people would call ahead. We found out that it was in France, it was a good idea to make reservations, to to call one night in advance to the guest house farther along the way and just make sure we had a bed and dinner for the night. And people would call for us for one thing because we had turned off our phone and for another because our French is indecipherable on the phone. And they would just make reservations for two Americans. Mm-hmm. But this is this is what people talk about. People talk about, oh, did you meet these people? And did you hear this? And did you did you see what this story was? And how far did this go? And did you find out that there were bed bugs in that place back there? But what I found was the people we met along the way, they weren't talking about current events. Got it. They were also not really talking about the other things that I feel like are are small talk when you first meet strangers. No one talked about what they did for a living. You know, you would know people for days or weeks before it would come out that they're oh an important executive in the airline industry because in this situation we're all wearing the same dirty hiking clothes we're all carrying basically the same backpack we're all sleeping in the same spaces and so there's not that nobody talks about work Mm -hmm. I find that in travel in general that Mm -hmm. you get like you just cut to the quick 
and you get into these deep conversations yeah. and you, and it's not about what you do is that kind of starting point. Right. Maybe family. We talk more about family than we would talk about work. We talk about where we're from. Oh, some of the fantastic conversations were just cultural pieces. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, there's a stork on that building. Well, what is what are the stories in Switzerland about storks? What are the stories here about? And what do Americans believe about storks, even though we don't have them? And <laughs> They and deliver how, babies. So this <laughs> funny side story, this guy is explaining to me very seriously that, you know, oh, well, where I come from, we have stories that storks deliver babies. And I said, well, we have that in the United States as well. And he says, but you do not have storks in the United <laughs> States. And I said... It's true. And he's like, well, how does that work? <laughs> and I had to think about it because you don't really question where that story comes from. Yeah. And you say, and I said, well, we don't have the Easter bunny or Santa Claus either, but we believe that they bring things. So right. I think it just all fits into the same category. Yep. I think so. And I guess I never thought about the fact that we don't have storks. We don't. I did research on this. Okay. There's some in Florida. I was going to say, it. I was going to say, I would have imagined that they were in Florida. Mm -hmm. There's and one small, there's one type of stork that's in the southeast and that's but not up here we have herons we have herons everywhere yeah what was it like for re-entry then when you had to when you really had to get back in, yeah. into technology our re-entry had a couple of specific challenges in that like i said before we are a one car family and our friend was driving that car to pick us up at the airport after being gone for three months and the car threw a rod and died on the side of the highway after you got picked up no. or on the way so to the airport? So we landed in the Vancouver airport, which is about three hours from home, across the Canadian border. <laughs> and we're standing in the customs line and I turned on my phone and I had a text message from our friends that said, had car trouble, had to leave it by the side of the road, went back to Seattle. Good luck. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to figure out another way home. Oh, no. And it was, it was this beautiful moment of, I've been making day-by-day -day travel plans for three months now. This would have freaked me out. But now I'm just, okay, you practice acceptance mm -hmm. and you, you adjust. Oh, this is not an option anymore. Let's adjust. Let's figure out what plan B is. Let's figure out what plan C is. It turned out that we ended up with like plan X because we landed in Vancouver on the day of the women's soccer finals. The World Cup mm. was in Vancouver and the United States was in it. And so <laughs> we had been offline. We have no idea what's going on mm. in the world. All I know is that every hotel is full and every bus trip back to Seattle is booked and every Amtrak back to Seattle is booked. And I'm going, and it's nine o'clock and we've been traveling for 23 hours and I'm figuring out my phone again for the first time going. And I finally went to the information counter and I went, something's happening. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but something's happening. And they told me, okay. And so the same, that friend ended up driving up in the middle of the night and he picked us up and we got home. But our re-entry was this, you have technology because you have to have a car towed and you have to go buy a car and you have to go back to work and you have to read three months worth of emails and there was this very definite like thrown back into the deep end kind of piece how um, long before you went back to work I would say I mean Eric had a more distinct you know this is right. the first day I went back into an office and he was I think he meant to do it within the first within like three or four days and then because we were dealing with car crises and things it maybe was four or five mm -hmm. but it was and then you probably slipped I, I, in a little I bit slid more slowly. right I slid in a little more slowly because most of my life in is a mixture of dealing with personal and professional mm -hmm. and so some days are 14 hours of one and some days are yeah. six hours of the other and and that happened but I know I know how that is that trans yeah I think most women know how that is <laughs> I well, think even women with office jobs have that sense of I'm I'm juggling I'm Half of my brain is still figuring out how carpool works and what our travel plans are. And half of my brain is at work wherever they are physically. I don't know many, I don't know many of my friends who go to the office and turn off home or who are at home and are not still thinking about work. There's always that sense that there are six things that we need to be doing, that we should be doing. Is it because in general, and I don't have kids myself, but is, is it because we are, because we have kids, because we are the domestic caretakers for the most part. I mean, I don't have children either. We're programmed that way. I think that, and I don't, I don't know that I see a difference in women who have children and women who don't in the 
ways that our brains can spaghetti together all of the different obligations and responsibilities of our lives. Spaghetti together. I like that. There was a book. Oh my gosh. It was probably 20, 25 years ago that came out and it was like, women are like waffles. Men are like waffles. Women are like spaghetti. Cause men had these, mm-hmm. you know, in this, in the stereotype, men have these very square little boxes where everything is compartmentalized and women's brains just mm-hmm. weave together all these different pieces. And I like to tell Eric at certain points when we're talking about one thing and I'm like, oh, but I have to tell you. And, 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 and I'm just like, I'm spaghettiing. It's fine. <laughs> just, just follow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think about that and that's totally not relevant to this nope. <laughs> conversation. We've, we've, gone, we've gone far left. We have, but, but yeah, I do think about that and I don't know. I think it makes us both successful and, mm-hmm. and a bit detrimental mm-hmm. because, because I think about me, whether it's, I don't think it's, ADD, ADHD, whatever the term mm-hmm. is these days. I don't know if it's that, but it's because I am like from this to that and, mm-hmm. you know, juggling and. And there's know. so many studies now that say that have talk about the challenges of multitasking and how we're never super effective when we're trying to do three things at the same time. Mm-hmm. But our culture is pushing us to do everything all at the same time, you know, because because all of the technology is, is feeding us everything at once. Mm-hmm. You know, and and so I can't yeah, I don't I don't know. I I continually fight the battle of focus. I continually fight the battle of pay attention to that one thing. And I believe to bring us back, one of the one of the real ex- experiences I found on the Camino and why I have gone back twice since the book was written, since the story that I tell in the book is that it is one of the places in the world where I can most easily be in one place. This idea of of put on a backpack, of go to the simplicity of you have, you know, you have such a limited, you have limited responsibilities for the day. You have limited things that you can do. And it's such a fascinating world in front of you because it is this cultural piece and this nature piece in your you're constantly walking through towns and seeing scenery and meeting people and you can entirely be present in that space. And I think, I don't think I've ever said it this way before, but that's what keeps pulling me back mm-hmm. is because I get to that place where I need a reset. Right. It's almost like an addiction to that healthier mm-hmm. lifestyle mm-hmm. probably. Or I, I think that we naturally have that, you know, there is the rhythm of the human space. Historically, people took Sabbath, people took evening you know before there was electricity you did all the things during the day and at night you had to stop Mm -hmm. because it's dark Mm -hmm. you take there's most cultures have some period of rest some period of withdrawal some period of of stop stop is kind of what yeah stop is what I want to say and that's and I feel like that's what I am trying to create in this modern life is a semi not regular because I've gone at strange times but an experience where there is a, a distinct, now it's time to stop. You mentioned trying to do that on Sundays, trying to shut off your uh, your technology. Devices, at yeah, least, your yeah. devices. Do you think it's possible to have our own downtime to, to create that, to go back to a time when not necessarily we don't have electricity, mm-hmm. you know, at night and it's all mm-hmm. dark, so we have to just read by candlelight, but like, what do you think it takes to do that and to be dedicated to a device-free day or to shut it off at 7 p.m. and More just have dinner. More discipline than I have. <laughs> More discipline than I have a lot of times. Uh, but I have fr- I, I know people who do this in different ways. I have a friend who has what she calls her Sabbath on fri- and at a certain point on Friday night to Saturday morning. I don't think it goes all day on Saturday. I think it's, it's just a Friday night. They don't use any technology that was created after a certain point. And they set a point that was right after indoor plumbing. Mm. <laughs> so, but, you know, not just no television, not just no phones, but... but Might not be know. the gas stove or something. It's just... Right, right. Like, what is it to plan ahead and, and be still? Mm-hmm. They try to spend, you know, when they're at home, and I guess it doesn't always work when traveling, but what is it like to, to turn everything off and just experience just for a few hours in the evenings. I love that idea. I have friends with kids who have what they consider what they call a Sabbath and it is mostly technology free and as much as possible it's schedule free. When you have kids, how do you have a whole day that you're not going to a practice or a birthday party or this or that? 
without being a total oddball. Right. But this is, and sometimes, you know what, maybe you're an oddball. If this is important to you. Yeah. If it's a mental health thing. And again, I haven't been able to pull it off, but if it's, if it's important to you, sometimes being an oddball isn't such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Good point. You mentioned having gone back there a couple of times. So you did, let's, maybe that's why I like this, like doing this podcast so much because I get to just I do the spaghetti thing and we're mm-hmm. all over the we're place. Over, we are all over the place. But today. it is but you know what? It's fun for me and I and hopefully listeners enjoy it too because we're just we're taking the path. We're we're just doing our own Camino <laughs> right here. So big picture, you did a thousand miles twenty fifteen mm-hmm. along one of the routes mm-hmm. of the Camino. Technically two of the routes, but they connect to each other. Okay. So the the trail across France has is called the Via Poriensis. And then it ends in a town at the border called St. John Port. And the Camino Francais is a town that starts in St. John. It's what most Americans know are more familiar with. And then crosses Spain and goes to Santiago. So we walked one continuous trail, but it has two different names. And so people who are familiar with Camino might get confused. But yeah, we walked for 79 days. We started in early April of 2015 and we arrived at the end of June in Santiago. And then we continued on. We did not end in Santiago. We continued on. There's four more days of trail to a town called Finisterre on the Atlantic Ocean, which was actually a pagan destination long before the Romans and the Christians started going to Santiago. So this has also been something that people have been journeying to for for centuries, because as far as they knew at that time, it was the farther and westernmost point of the world. And so they would go there and watch the sun set into the ocean. And I kind of decided that if I was going to walk that far, if I was going to walk that long, my goal was never Santiago. My goal was never St. James. My goal was the ocean. Mm. Because you walk until you cannot walk any farther. You walk until you run into water and then you have to turn around. And so we went to Finisterre and we spent four days there. And every night we would walk out to the point and watch the sun set into the ocean surrounded by other people who had also done the same thing. And so it's just this fantastic celebration and party. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned also before we started recording the clamshell, you had, you had scallop shell. Oh, the scallop shell. Yeah. Sorry. So the scallop shell, can you describe that and then kind of how these routes work? So the historic symbol of the Camino de Santiago, the way of St. James has been a scallop shell. And there are about six different stories for why that is. But going back to the earliest pilgrims, you know, the earliest descriptions of pilgrims, they're always carrying a scallop shell. Maybe they got it at Santiago and they would bring it home as the sign that they had actually made it to their destination because we didn't have Instagram and you couldn't just text a picture. And there's a lot of seafood and a lot that area of that area of Spain, that area of the coast is really well known for for their their seafood and their shells and those kind of things. One of the stories, the one that I really love about why the scallop shell specifically represents the Camino is that if you look at it, it has these little lines that go, they all come into a point, but then they all branch out. And the way that the Camino also works is it is not one single trail. I get a lot of people who ask me, oh, you walked the whole thing. <laughs> That's what I thought. I thought a thousand miles. Of I, course, it has to be the whole thing. I wasn't going to out you like that. <laughs> some people, um, some people, <laughs> your host. <laughs> lots, of, Actually, lots of people have said, oh, you walked the whole thing. And it's kind of fun. In the back of the book, there is actually a map that shows you the variety of different trails because people would start from wherever they lived. And if they live in the UK or if they live in the Netherlands, if they live in Germany, if they live in Italy, they're coming from different directions. And so there are four trails that start in France, in different parts of France that are recognized by the United Nations as World Heritage Sites because the earliest recorded records of of people talking about the Camino and the pilgrimage there's a book that came out that, that was published, that was written and distributed in the 1100s. It's the earliest known travel guide mentioned that people gathered in these four places. But there's also about a dozen trails that crisscross Spain and Portugal and people come from all different directions. And so there's ne- it's one of those things that you're never done with. People mm-hmm. say, oh, if, if you walk the whole thing, you have to keep going back and starting over and walking another trail and walking another trail. 
And that was part of it. And so I'm never, this is one of those experiences that you're never done. We went back in 2018 and started walking an entirely different trail. Also marked as the Camino. It follows the northern coastline. How long was that trip? That trip, we were gone for three weeks. We walked 17 days. We walked about 300 miles. Mm -hmm. um, And also unplugged during that time? Less unplugged. Like we were not as, we were not as religious about there is no cell phone. We were checking email a little bit more often. We were a little less, we were a little more available, but we were not, you turn off the phone all day during the day. You might check it every couple of days to see. Was it a different experience with that? It was a different experience because of the technology. It was a different experience because we were only gone for three weeks, not three months. And so we hadn't put our entire, you know, when you leave for three months, you kind of feel like you've put your entire life on pause. Mm -hmm. You say goodbye to friends like you're never going to see them again. Um, And you have to make sure that your bills are being paid and everything. With three weeks, you have accessibility and, you know, you can pay for stuff before or after a trip. It's a little more more like planning a normal vacation and Mm -hmm. a little less like planning a full-on sabbatical. Mm -hmm. And so we never felt like we were quite as far away. I still am intentional about I'm not posting online. I'm not sharing my stories while I'm gone. I'm not... I'm not social mediaing. I was definitely off social media, but my phone was out. We were also, I was also using, you know, booking.com to make some reservations for places to stay and and just taking advantage of some of those, the technology benefits. Mm -hmm. So you went back, uh, you also mentioned that you had been back yourself, Mm -hmm. went back with a friend. Talk about that. Yeah. So Eric and I walked for three months in 2015 and we came back and not surprisingly, all we could do was talk about this trip. I mean, we had all of the stories. We had all of the pictures. We were those annoying people with vacation photos. And one of our friends who was about to turn 70, her name is Laurel, and she just said, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. And she talked about it for about a year, and she was really enthusiastic, came to all of our stuff. And all of your talks. All of our talks, Mm -hmm. all of our our gatherings, all of our parties, actually, Mm -hmm. back then, because the book wasn't out yet. But, and she had made plans with a friend of hers to go. She was going to do this. And you have to, Laurel was turning 70. She hadn't traveled outside the country by herself before. She didn't have a lot of travel experience. She grew up on Whidbey Island. She's been there. She's been in the Pacific Northwest. And at the last minute, her friend couldn't go. Had some family care issues and just couldn't leave. And I found myself, we, had, we were having dinner that one, about that time, and I found myself saying, well, I can't go with you for the whole time, but I really believe that you need to do this, and if it will make you feel more comfortable, I'll go with you for the first couple of weeks, just to get there. Mm-hmm. Not that I have this world of travel experience. I have been to Europe at that point exactly once, <laughs> um, which is once more than she had, so... And yeah, but so, you were there for a, a hell of a long time. We were there for a hell of a long time. And, and I knew Camino. Like yeah. if I could get us, if I could figure out how to get us to Pamplona, mm-hmm. I knew what happened after that. And so we did. And so we flew to Madrid and we figured out trains and we got ourselves to Pamplona and we started walking. And I walked with her for about 10 days. I don't remember how the distance, but we walked for about 10 days across Spain on mostly on trails that I had walked before. And met fantastic people and had drink wine and made friends who I still am friends with. And then I went home and she kept going. And she made friends with this group of women who from Canada and from Italy and from Germany and from Spain. And they arrived in Santiago together and they had such a good time. They stayed in touch. They went back the next year. (laughs) So on for her 71st birthday, mm. she went back to Spain, flew there by herself, got herself around, gathered with this group of friends and set off again. Changed her life. And they would start, yeah, they would text us pictures of them dancing in the bars at night and like walking up the hills and they, they had a great time. She's traveling now to visit them and, mm. and has just really, it, it did, it changed. I think, I don't want to speak for her, but I think it changed her life. Mm-hmm. I think it changed her perspective of what she was capable of. Well, sure. Somebody who hadn't traveled much outside of her home region goes and takes this big trip, which actually reminds me of you, Mm -hmm. because you you mentioned um, to me previously that you uh, are from the East Coast. I am from the East Coast. I grew up in a small town in southern New Jersey that 
has a beautiful history and has great stuff, but is where definitely where, what town? It's called Millville, mm-hmm. but was part of the you know the, when the factories closed. There's a lot of things on the East Coast where you'll find a town that has a lot of history and a great big boarded up factory. And so that was kind of my story. We were were from a small town that was pretty rural and people didn't travel much. This is something I didn't really think about until after I left. But after you left New Jersey. After I left. Yeah. After Mm -hmm. I moved, started moving away. And the people took road trip vacations and they might go you know, to Virginia Beach. We went, my parents and I, we Or you go went down to the New, shore. We went down the shore. Oh, you just do that for the weekend. We went to New England every year. So we would take a road trip up to, up through New England and Maine and, and we would see all the things. But people didn't travel farther than that. People didn't adventure travel. And I was talking to my dad a couple of weeks ago and he mentioned that he has never been farther south than Virginia. And he has been as far west as Colorado, but that's only because I was living there and getting <laughs> married there and he might sh- maybe should show up for that. He's never been to Seattle. I've lived in Seattle for 10 years. That's like um, my family. My family's in New Jersey. I grew up yeah. there as well. So, Ah, uh, that's why you asked where. Yeah. And so, you know, they value tradition. They value being close. They value family in certain ways. And I love that. But there was never the sense of, oh, go see the world. Mm-hmm. And so for me, and Eric has a similar story. Eric grew up in New York in a community that also you road trip to the Virginia Beach, but you don't get on an airplane and go somewhere mm-hmm. else. And so we, you know, we, we thought we were brave. We thought we were bold. We, you know, we went to college in Chicago and we moved to Denver because that's where I got a job after school and we lived there for a long time. And that was so far away. But there was this whole world out there and I kept reading books about it. You know, my experience, I, I, experience life through books. And I kept reading books about it. And there's this whole world out there that I hadn't seen. What books were you reading? Do you remember? Oh, goodness. I love fiction. I love travel memoir. I love memoir. I couldn't give you one particular Mm -hmm. one. I think this is, you know, 30 years of reading about people in every corner of the world Mm -hmm. and knowing that that's a possibility. Because I did the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, early on, I just, I was captured by these books like Robin Davidson. Tracks. um, Yeah, tracks. Exactly. And so I would read something like that and just be like, oh my God, like I have to go. Oh, and I was never, that was never, uh, that was too much for me. Robin's Robin's book. I mean, that was, that was camels and deserts. And (sighs) I, I am not that, I never saw myself as being that kind of adventurer. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure exactly how to buy a plane ticket and go and like, I was scared of figuring out how to get through Charles de Gaulle airport from the airplane to the train. Mm -hmm. Like, well, so I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't would, looking, yeah, I wasn't looking for the, I, I listened to your interviews about, well, I walked across Antarctica and I just, <laughs> I don't know that that <laughs> yeah, ever was the thing are, that, yeah. I don't know that that was the thing that would have appealed to me. It's cool that they do it, but just to see things, just mm-hmm. to experience things for the first time. Mm-hmm. And so we had this, and there was just this kind of growing sense that there is this world and we have limited time in it. And the longer I spend spinning my wheels and doing my job and not remembering something at the end of the year, the longer I'm putting off this decision of, no, let's just go. And so finally, you know, we had been talking about doing this Camino trip for a long time. We had kind of said, you know, we talked to the jobs and we knew that this was probably coming up next spring. And there was finally just this point where it was, it kept scaring me. And so I kept putting off the decision, the details of it. If I haven't actually bought plane tickets, it hasn't happened yet. (laughs) And it's not going to. (laughs) If I haven't really thought about, you know, physical training, then I'm not really going to walk a thousand miles. And I finally just, and you just get to a point where one night everything was, there was just too much and my list was too long and I was overwhelmed and I just bought plane tickets Mm -hmm. and thought, how far out was that? Four months, Mm, three or four months. But you hadn't really done a lot of formal training and didn't really know what you were getting into in terms of the gear. I trained in the way that I knew how to train, which is I read everything. (laughs) (laughs) I read all the books and I read all the websites and I signed up for the Facebook groups where people were sharing their experiences. And I, I did a lot of research and I'm a great online shopper and I found all the deals. And so like I had made a list of things that people said we needed and I had gone down and started buying those and it had I didn't physically train. Mm-hmm. Now, whether that is because that was the intimidating thing to me, I can make a list. Mm-hmm. I can buy you some could stuff. Buy stuff. I don't know anything about sleeping bags, but I can buy one. Mm-hmm. You just couldn't test it out. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know. And I was 
you know, I, I can make a lot of excuses. I was busy. I was trying to meet all these deadlines before we left. But really, it comes down to, I didn't know how to train. I didn't know what those words meant. Mm-hmm. I didn't understand, you know, what putting a backpack on would do to my body. I And we didn't, these are not big, I'm carrying a tent and a stove and three days worth of water backpacks. This is a a 36 liter pack. It weighed about 22 pounds. I was really surprised when I saw the photo of you in the mm-hmm. backpack. It's just, it looks so small because you think, I am used to seeing backpackers going through Europe camping. and you've got, yeah, not even camping, but uh, you know, like, oh, I'm off on this big backpacking tri- trip and you've got a big backpack. Mm-hmm. But like you said, you had a change of clothes, right. basically. But your bag is so small. I was I was really impressed with it, but I was shocked that it that it was as small yeah. as it was. Well, and a lot of people will tell you it's too big because you know everybody has an opinion. When we start talking about gear, everybody has an opinion, and oh, your pack should not weigh more than ten percent of your body weight, which I think must be a rule that was made by three hundred pound men, right. because yeah, because there's no way with water that you can right yeah right by the time you have one change of clothes and an and an indoor weight sleeping bag. And I have a full packing list in my book as well because because I was looking for that kind of information and people would say things like, oh, you just pack toiletries. I don't know <laughs> what kind of toiletries I need. Mm-hmm. I don't know what. Yeah. So I have, yeah, I have a pack that's about 22 pounds that I packed for the first time the night before we left <laughs> that I carried the first time to the airport the, the day that we left because it I didn't understand that that was going to change the way that I walked, the way that mm-hmm. weight put pressure on right. my feet. You and know, your you, muscles and your and back your muscles and, and everything. Back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You always hear about women whose feet grow during pregnancy. You know, my feet grew a size while I was pregnant or whatever. My feet grew a size walking three months across Europe mm-hmm. with a 20 pound pack. Yeah, I, I, I could see that. And they've never gone back. Mm-hmm. Well, it's your arch flattening, isn't it? It probably. I think that's what happens because I I found that in running since mm-hmm. I've started running that my that I'm a half size larger, mm-hmm. and I think it's because your arch. That's what I've understood. Mm-hmm. At and least. I have ex- I have still extremely high arches. Mm-hmm. One of the things one of the other things I learned about myself once I started doing this walk is that I have really odd feet and gait, and I have very high arches, which create all kinds of problems for walking unless you have special shoes and special arch supports, which I had none of when I left. I went to REI and I said, this is the walk I'm doing. And the very nice person said, oh, these are the tr- shoes that everybody who's hiking wears. <laughs> and they're Do you trail remember what run- they were? They're tr- they were Merrill trail runners. They were zero drop, which I was a big fan of at the time and very minimal. And I thought, if these are the shoes that I would wear around the city, sure, these are the shoes I can wear while walking across two trail. countries. Mm-hmm. And again, I think it was that intimidation factor. If I could convince myself that this, I kept trying to convince myself this wasn't a hike. I wasn't backpacking. I was going for a long walk because that was something I could I could do. Right. You could wrap your head around I could get that. my head around that. And so I'm going to wear the same shoes that I would wear anywhere else. Except then I'm going to put 22 pounds on my back and then I'm going to walk 15 miles a day every day over rocky you know, you're off paved trails, you're walking over rocks, you're going up and down hills. And my feet just fell apart. I In what was, way? I think probably there, there was a lot of tendonitis going on and I just have very tender feet. There so, is not, a, there's not, I've talked to podiatrists, I've talked to sports medicine doctors. There's not a, a specific word for this, but I just have incredibly sensitive feet that would swell up and ache. I never mm-hmm. got blisters. Mm-hmm. I so never, it was pain. It was, it pain. was painful. And I could feel, we started calling them the princesses because I could feel every little rock Mm. under. And Mm -hmm. so it would just be, it was just this miserable experience. And I would start out okay every morning. And then within, you know, five kilometers, 10 kilometers, I would just start to hurt. And this went on for about two weeks. And every day I would just be miserable. And I was, oh my God. And everything around me is beautiful. I don't want to go home. I want to keep doing this. But oh my gosh, why do my feet hurt so much all the time? And there was one point at which I was just, I was grumbling and complaining. And Eric kind of loses patience with it. And it's like, I don't know how to help you. I don't know whether, you know, do we need to take more rest days? Do we need to find you a doctor? Do we need to buy new shoes? And he said that. And I have no idea what he said after that because 
that was the last thing I heard. And because this light bulb went off in my brain and I went, I can buy new shoes. <laughs> I'm yes, I am walking along a medieval trail in what feels like the middle of nowhere. But this is still France. This is still a first world country. You can stop at the office of tourism in the next town. They will call you a cab. Within 10 minutes, you are at a strip mall next to a highway that basically looks like Dick's Sporting Goods. Mm -hmm. And the very nice people who only speak French will look at you in your sad feet and will pull out a bunch of supply and gear and tell you to buy it all and you'll just hand over your credit card. And you wouldn't have been the first person nope. attempting to do the Camino who stopped in there right. with that sad look right. on your face. Right. They looked at me. They looked at my backpack. They said, oh, compostela. I'm like, yep. <laughs> and they said, this is what you need. And so they had set me up with much more structured hiking shoes. Mm -hmm. I do not know the details of them. They were Salomon. Salomon. Yeah, Sal Salomon. Salomon. Just Salomon. <laughs> is this, I never know if it's, I always want to add an A somewhere in there. Salomon. I think um, there's an A in it, but I, but I think it's just Salomon. Okay. And structured arch supports and hiking poles. And I don't want to say that that made everything better, but that made everything so much better. That was the turning mm -hmm. point. And part of that was... I made the mental decision that I was going to do something to fix this problem. Mm. And part of it was just the pure physical. I had arch supports and I had enough structure under my feet mm -hmm. to carry the extra weight on my back and go forward. And so, you know, that kind of makes such a difference to it. And I've done so much shoe research in the three years, four years since then. I've done so much foot research in the four years since then. What but did you wear when you went back in 2018? I am a huge fan of Hoka One Ones. Oh, no kidding. Hoka's. Uh-huh. They hmm. are they are really well padded. They have a good a good rocking position. Mm -hmm. There's still fairly minimal drop, so mm -hmm. there's not a lot of height between your heel and your toe, but there's just a lot of stuff going on around them that for me really helps. And yeah. then I had a podiatrist who recommended a specific kind of arch in arch support called arch rivals. Mm -hmm. And for people Clever who name, have, by yeah, the way. I know, isn't that mm -hmm. awesome? For people who have like really high arches, it's those have been fantastic as well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hiking in those waterproof. They're amazing. You know, I run in zero drop shoes and and it's funny, I've spoken with the folks at Hoka and they tell me, oh yeah, these are this Hoka is just like your other, your Pearl Izumis or, mm -hmm. you know, other zero drop shoes. And it's so hard for me to grasp that because they're so tall. Yeah. But that's what they say is that yeah. they are still zero drop. Yeah. So even though, but it's all that padding. Yeah. In it's, there. They're, ver they're zero drop or they're very, min I think the hiking shoes might be like a 0.05 or something. Mm -hmm. like it's, it's a tiny difference, mm -hmm. but there's so much padding and that's, that is really what, that's what you my needed. feet needed. Mm -hmm. And people ask me a lot, you know, People ask me, oh, well, what, what are the right shoes to do this? And there is no answer for that mm -hmm. because everyone's feet are so very different. Eric has, you know, Eric has feet that sweat a lot, not to be gross, but like, and so he's really prone to blisters and could never wear the waterproof, you know, confined shoes that mm -hmm. I have. He needs ultras that are as wide and as breathable and as bendy mm -hmm. as possible. Mm. and he, that's what he wore across the country and it has worked and he's gone back to the same brand of shoes every time since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is really interesting that it is so different for mm -hmm. every person. I have, um, I tried a pair of On, O-N, running shoes Okay. and I went out a couple of times and my, my feet hurt so badly. Like just on, I, I wanted to just kind of break them in. So I thought, okay, I'll go out for a little three mile run. And my feet were hurting so badly, I just wanted to come right back. I did, I think I ended up doing three miles and four miles and another three miles or something. So total 10 in these in these shoes, because I really wanted to give them a shot because I'd heard so many great things about them. But my feet hurt. Like, right. I wanted to cry. They're not your shoes. Right. And I talked to somebody about it and they're like, oh, yeah, that's just like, that just happens. Like, and I just thought my feet needed to get used to it. Mm -hmm. But that was not the case. Right. It was just, oh, and so painful. And people love the Merrells that I threw in a trash can in France. Oh, yeah. And people love different kinds of things. And so you just, you have to, I've learned a lot from this experience just about my own body, which is something that I did not pay a lot of attention to before, mm -hmm. and how I travel differently and how my feet are different and my gait is different and my leg, I, it turns out I have short legs. And so that makes certain things different and piece after piece after piece, but also None of these things are stopping points. None of these are, oh, I can't do it because. Mm -hmm. All of these are just, I need to figure out how to make this work for me. I'm going to be the slowest person to walk up a hill. 
but and I'm still okay. going to get there. Right. And that's okay. I'm going to get blown past by the 80 year olds. It's mm-hmm. fine. I'm still going to get there. Mm-hmm. I think it's a really good point about kind of listening to your own body because we do tend to, especially, uh, you know, we, we <laughs> tend to look at uh, reviews and TripAdvisor mm-hmm. and, and make decisions based on others' experiences and even make our dietary decisions based on mm-hmm. the headlines. And we forget to just pay attention to what's right for us. Right. Because that, I mean, really, that's the critical thing. It's right. like, it's okay to, you know, to test stuff out, keep track of what works, what doesn't work, and mm-hmm. then dump it, mm-hmm. leave your shoes in France if that's, yeah. if they don't work for you and, yeah. you know, go try something else. There are so many guidebooks published now about various Camino trails and they are almost all like most hiking books they're set up in stages and you walk this stage goes from this town to this town and I would meet people who say oh well I have to get to this town no you don't Mm -hmm. there are towns every five kilometers along the way with places to stay if your body doesn't want to walk 30 kilometers Mm -hmm. don't if you need a break yeah if you need a break or if it turns out you know my natural I am great from about 20 to 25 kilometers a day about 12 to 20 12 to 15 miles a day. That's my comfortable walking distance. I can push it farther than that if I have to, but my body starts breaking down. I still have bad feet. I still have issues with certain things. And so I'm never going to be a 40 mile a day walker. But I met people who, who were great at that and who are really comfortable at that. Well, we forget that we make our own rules. Mm-hmm. And even if we have verbalized something, we can change the rules. Right. That there, there's nothing that's set in stone. Right. And we just, we have to give ourselves permission. Right. And so we do. And so one of the things I like about this trip is because, because it goes through places that are fairly well populated, it's not like you have to go a certain distance and you can, you can kind of make a decision day by day, how you're feeling. What's the weather doing? Where's, you know, oh, I did a long day yesterday. I think I'll do a shorter day tomorrow. You're not, some people will make their entire agenda in advance and that's great. I know people who have made reservations for every night of their Camino and they printed it all up and they put it in a little spiral bound book and they, they have that plan. And I know people who set out walking in the morning and they have no idea where they're going to stay that night. Mm-hmm. I tend to fall somewhere in the middle. I like I like the night before to know what my goal is for the next day. Mm-hmm. But there's room for spontaneity. But there's so much room for spontaneity. There's mm-hmm. so much room for, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll We'll see how things are going. And I know most people have had at least one time where they got halfway to where they thought they were going and went, no, nah, I think I'm done today. I'm just, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stay here. Mm-hmm. And sometimes those are the most magical days. Yeah, you know, Our absolutely. most magical day happened because Eric got a blister and we stopped 10 kilometers before we thought we were going to. And it, in this medieval town that was, had walls around it and had this cathedral with a spiral on the steeple and he stayed in, in this place where we were staying right in the city walls. And I went and explored and just fell in love with this little town because we had all afternoon there. Mm. It sounds very European, like just kind of that attitude of like, we're going to stay and kind of hang out here, Mm -hmm. which reminds me of something. I think I can't remember if I heard it on a podcast that you had done or read it somewhere about you that there is a big difference between the way Americans approach Uh, maybe taking an adventure, doing an adventure Mm -hmm. like this and the way that Europeans do. So can you describe that difference? So when we were there, people, like I said, people were kind of fascinated by the fact that there were Americans, especially walking across France. And they would ask like, oh, well, what what is it like in the United States? And do you have trails like this? Because Europe is just crisscrossed with these beautiful walking trails. And we would kind of laugh and try to explain the Appalachian Trail. And they would go, wait, but it does not go through towns. It does. What do you eat? Where do you sleep? Mm-hmm. And, and what I realized is that I think in the United States, we treat long distance hiking, through hiking especially, like a sport. It is about the physical experience of it primarily and the nature of it. And, and in Europe, it's more like a holiday. So in Europe, people almost always, when the people retire, they go for two week walks or they spend two weeks walking every year and they just pick up a trail where they left off. But the trails intentionally go through towns. The trails intentionally go past cultural sites. 
There are guest houses all along the way. There are stands set up along the way where people are sharing fruit or juice or something. And it is as much about the four course dinner that you have at the end of the day, sitting around a table in a guest house with people from all around the world cooked by the local person who lives here, as it is about the physical challenge of climbing a mountain, which isn't to say you're not still walking outside for many hours, but there's this balance of it's not supposed to be. I gave a talk at an event here in Seattle and I called it through hiking without suffering <laughs> because, you know, you do, you, you're still walking, but you walk five kilometers and you stop and you have a latte and you walk five kilometers and you stop and you have a croissant. And that's more the European way. And that is very much more the European way. You stop at the market and you buy your fruit and your cheese and then you have a picnic by the side of the road and you, you know, you're not, you're not trying you're not eating bad f Europeans are not going to eat bad food mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, especially in France right especially in France but yeah also in Spain you're going to be able to stop along the way you're going to be able to to visit the cathedrals that were built to serve the people who have been walking this trail for a thousand years you're going to be able to stop at the Gaudi, the museums that were designed by Gaudi. You're going to stop and see the city walls that have been defending since the Roman times mm -hmm. and the Knights Templar and all of these stories. Mm -hmm. And that is as much about, that is as much of the experience. Have you been able to bring that into your world here? What do you mean? Well, um, when John, my husband and I, when we were in Italy, we went, where were we? I can't remember what city we were in. We were somewhere. We had this lunch outside, of course. And, and it took hours. And we absolutely loved it. We're on vacation, right? Mm -hmm. And we're noticing that everybody else had been there before us, and they were still there after, <laughs> you know, after yeah. we left. So it was a three or four hour affair for them having lunch. And we talk about that, like, on occasion, we, we come back and we have something like that. We'll go out to dinner or lunch with friends, a brunch, and it goes on for a long time. And we're like, yeah, you know, that was like that time that, you know, we were in Italy and we had that amazing lunch. But there's so much more to it. I read a book years ago called Almost French, which is a okay. fantastic book about this American woman who goes to live with her French boyfriend in Paris. And she makes all these observations about the French and kind of how she's, I mean, she's trying to incorporate it as well. She's making the observations. But I just remember it's kind of like they won't walk out the door unless their shoes are shined. And I think about that all the time, about just the taking the time to make sure that everything is just so. Mm -hmm. Because me, I mean, I work from home. I'm dressing pretty relaxed every day. I'm not worrying about whether my shoes are shined or right. not. And if I do have to go out to dinner, I'll probably just grab my shoes out of my closet and I go go run out the door. So that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about is that it's that European kind of attention to detail and appreciation for things mm -hmm. and those leisurely long four-hour meals in the evening around a mm -hmm. bon you know bonfire that you're having. Are you able to come back and then kind of remember that and appreciate it and say, hey, let's have a leisurely lunch, or you just find yourself naturally doing it, or you're polishing your shoes or taking care of things a little bit differently? The thing about walking across Europe is you're never quite dressed. Like <laughs> we, we had some time at the end of this walk. We got there before we had to fly back, and we talked about going to Paris, and I just looked at my ratty hiking pants and my, you know, nylon shirt and went I don't I can't I don't look like Paris I can't mm -hmm, go to mm -hmm. Paris for this trip and so but I don't can... I don't have a lot of that I do I don't have a lot of perspective on that every time I go to Europe I'm like dressed and but I'm also not in the cities and I'm staying in in the rural places where they expect me to look like a hiker but you said they're you're gonna they're not gonna eat poorly they're gonna have a nice mm -hmm. croissant and they're gonna have a mm -hmm. nice cup of espresso so, and they're going to sit down and have, and have lunch and spend that time. And you see it when you go through the towns is there's less, there's just less stuff coming at them. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard thing to bring back is that they don't work 50 hours a week. No one in Europe works 50 or 60 hours a week the way we do. And they're not traveling all over. And they're, one of the things I love is that in Spain, especially if you're in a town, you go at, in the late afternoon, 
early evening and it to the town square and just everyone gathers there. This is this is probably my example of your four hour lunch. And the kids are running around and playing ball and chasing each other and doing whatever. And the grandparents are all sitting on the benches watching solemnly <laughs> what's going on, but are part of it. And the parents and the, you know, the people our age are, are lingering and chatting with their neighbors and chatting with their friends. And everybody has like a glass of wine from the bars that just hand you wine and you can carry it around. And and it's just for a couple of hours every evening. It's just everybody's outside. No one's looking at their phone. Maybe a phone will ring and somebody will answer it and be like, I'm on the left side and hang up. And <laughs> it's somebody coming to them. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think there's, it's that attention to the present. It's, it's coming back to this thing that we started talking about at the beginning. It's this attention to the present. It's attention to, I am going to have dinner and this is the most important thing. Or I'm going to be here in the plaza with my neighbors and my friends and my extended family. And this is the most important thing. And how do you bring that back here? I did some, I tried to do some winnowing. I tried to do some prioritizing. I tried to look at my life when I got back and say, I'm spread too thin. Like it really, I, I continue to believe that most of the American thing comes down to I'm just spread too thin. And I need to focus on fewer people, fewer projects, fewer fewer things and do them better fewer moving parts yeah Yeah. i'd rather have a small handful of really good friends who i can spend four hours with who i can make a tradition we have friends who we have dinner with every wednesday wow and have for since it had just started before we left so have for about five years and it's a big enough crew that if we're traveling they're still meeting or if we're busy they're still there and they're going away and like how it's not our group yeah it's a group And, you know, recognizing the importance of that. And I feel like we probably have prioritized that dinner. We probably have prioritized that gathering in part because of what we learned, Mm -hmm. in part because we saw the importance of the tradition of getting together and knowing people well. Mm -hmm. We eat a lot more cheese now, (laughs) (laughs) which is maybe not what you were asking at all. But I'm thinking, I'm trying to think, like, what did we bring back? And Well, it's the difference. Cheese plates. I brought back cheese plates. Well, it's like, to me, it's like the difference between going to the Safeway where they do have croissants, mm-hmm. and I will not eat a Safeway cr- croissant, and going to Bakery Nouveau, mm-hmm. which is uh, not too far from here, which is an award-winning French bakery. Mm-hmm. And even though I eat mostly plant-based slash vegan, I will have a croissant occasionally from Bakery Nouveau, mm-hmm. because you can't pass that up. Right. So it's that kind of thing. It's like making decisions that are quality decisions, mm-hmm. rather than buying into the kind of the mass market and the Right. Just every the the onslaught mm-hmm. of of decisions, yeah. Of- and that's and I think that's partly the European culture. I think that's also partly just the you know when so, you when you've lived for three months with nothing but the two sets of clothes, it turns out you don't need all new clothes. It turns out you don't maybe you don't need all of these new things. It, mm-hmm. you, my life got much simpler, and we have made really intentional decisions. We live in a one bedroom apartment in Seattle. We live in less than 700 square feet. Mm-hmm. And that has always been one of the the challenges and also the opportunities of you have to prioritize. You have to, it's hard to get overwhelmed by stuff right? when you have nowhere to put it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Our apartment is smaller than the garage that we had when we owned a house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, well, so all some- of, and so all of those pieces are part of it. And I think part of that is what inspired me to take the trip and the things that definitely happened inside of me when... I turned off and when I started walking and when I started traveling and seeing how different people live and seeing these pieces continue to influence that back. Like I think that there's a loop. Mm -hmm. And there's something really liberating about that as Mm -hmm. well. The simplification of it all. Yeah. I keep, I keep trying. I keep trying to keep life simple. Life keeps fighting me on it. But Mm -hmm. I think that that's probably really relatable to a lot of people. Mm Mm-hmm. I think so. For every for every trip you take to Goodwill, six new things come in the house. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really great place to wrap it up. I feel like we did come full circle Fantastic. from the beginning. Is there anything else that you wanted to cover that we haven't? I mean, there's a gazillion things we haven't covered. But yeah, was is there like, anything? There's, a, there's a lot of specifics about the trip, but I feel like that material is out there. I feel like Well, you, it's in the book. It's in the book. My trip is absolutely in the book. Yeah. Um, and the surprises and the history and the the people we met and the things we saw and all of that is definitely in the book. And 
I think it comes down to this idea that I wrote the book and I drove to West Seattle today and I'm, I'm here to talk to you because of this sense of if I could do this, anybody can do this. I didn't write a book because I wanted to, you know, share some deep personal insight about something. I shared this because I was a person who loves my couch and my cat and my books and thought that some kind of grand physical adventure was beyond me. And when I came back from this, people would say, oh, you did that. I could never do that. I don't do extreme sports. <laughs> and I wanted to say, I think yoga is an extreme sport. You know, this, this wasn't an extreme something. This was a, you can put one foot in front of the other and you do it over and over, whatever, wherever you're starting from. And it becomes this life-changing experience. And it becomes this thing that you can look back on at the end of the year and say, I, I did this. I did this and it will be something I remember for the rest of my life. And you're building upon it now and you're showing other people, yeah. not only like not only through the book, but you physically helped someone else get mm -hmm. through the process, mm -hmm. which is an amazing gift. Yeah. And really. is something that was and, and, and changed my entire experience of it. Traveling with someone else and being... And, and having that different dynamic was an entirely different experience. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, continuing to make this, you know, and I'm, I've been on book tour and I've talked to a lot of groups at bookstores and REIs and different places and, and watching that light bulb go on of saying, oh, you're not, you're not some extreme athlete. You're not actually an athlete at all. Like You're an everyday person. Who I show them really awkward photos of myself mm -hmm. trying to to accomplish something, you know, just walk up a hill and go, if, if I can do this, there's no reason why it's out of reach for anybody else. Right. I end these conversations by asking the question, what does it mean for you to be bold? I'm going to, I'm going to ask that question, but I first want to ask you, do you think you were bold in doing this? Yes. Yes. Because I had to gather that, that courage. So I'm going to say yes. Mm -hmm. I think being bold is saying yes. I think being bold is saying, yes, I can do that when an opportunity comes up or when something interesting comes up, even when you have no idea how you're going to do that. I think being bold is not talking yourself out of something because you think you're not that enough, whatever X, that mm -hmm. X enough, and just being willing to throw yourself into something and, and try it. You're, you're going to surprise yourself. Thanks for coming here today. Absolutely. Thank you. This was it. a fun conversation. I was This um, went in a lot of different directions. It sure did. Spaghetti. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I uh, was so grateful that the weather broke because yesterday it was like 87 degrees or something. And this, my office was really oh, hot. Sure. I did just did not have a cross breeze. And I, and yesterday afternoon I was like, oh my God, I hope the weather breaks because it's going to be so hot in there. It's but it's Seattle. Nice. We don't do, we don't do 90 degrees for more than a day at a time. No, we don't. And not in June either. Early exactly. June. It's crazy. Okay. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I will link to your book in the show notes sure. and encourage people to find your, your talk. Um, I know there's some the website, probably the Camino Times Two website is the best. Okay, great. Place I'll link to, send to them because that. that's that's got my blog, that's got the pictures, that's got packing lists, and right. like I've just been writing. I have been writing about Camino outside of the book there for four years. Yeah, and you've also got. And I'll also link to this too. I meant to mention your social media accounts. Mm -hmm. I know you've got some beautiful photos of the Camino on your Instagram account. Yep. so I'll link to that. Uh, yeah, as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Absolutely. <laughs> I can't wait to dive into her book, Walking to the End of the World, A Thousand Miles on the Camino de Santiago. She certainly makes it all seem quite doable, doesn't she? There's a, uh, an 800-mile walk in Japan that's been on my radar for a long time, and it goes from temple to temple. And after hearing about her walk, now it's like really reignited my interest in doing uh, this walk in Japan. So much to do, so little time. Check out Beth Jacino's website at bethjacino.com, and that's J-U-S-I-N-O. And pick up a copy of her book wherever you find books. Send it to a friend. I'm sure you know somebody who has wanted to do the Camino or who has done it, and I bet they'll find uh, a lot of information and, and stories in it that they can relate to. So pick it up at your local uh, bookstore if you can support them. Otherwise, I'm going to link to it in the show notes to Amazon. 
for those links and for links to all the things that we chatted about in this episode, go to she's bold podcast.com slash episodes. And there you will find the show notes for this and all of my other conversations. You can also find those links and show notes in whatever podcast app it is you're using to listen to this. If you'd like to support the show and hear a bonus question that Beth answered, you can become a patron through patreon.com. It means you can be a supporter. Tell me, just give me a vote of confidence that you enjoy the show and you can do it for as little as a buck a month. You can find out more by going to she's boldpodcast.com slash Patreon. You can also sign up for the She's Bold podcast newsletter from the site's homepage. And there I just send out a little alert each time an episode comes out. You can connect with me by friending me on Facebook. And I'm Beth Witwa on Instagram, B-E-T-H-W-H-I-T-W-A. Ladies, you can join the Be Bold Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Be Bold group for support and encouragement for whatever ways you are trying to be bold. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the She's Bold podcast. And until next time, be bold.